Before I get into our study this morning, on behalf of Jody and I want to express all of you. Appreciate your prayers and concerns. Glad we're to this point. Of course, Jody's a whole lot tougher than I am. She gets over it a lot faster than I do. And that's not a joke, that's true. <laughs> But anyway, we are glad to be here and glad to hear of others who are doing better and certainly trust that we'll be able to get over this surge at this particular time. If you would open your Bibles to the 15th chapter of the book of John, John chapter 15. I want us to read the first eight verses. John 15, verses 1 through 8. And Jesus is speaking, and he actually is speaking directly to his apostles. And what he has to say here is so important to all of us if we would be faithful and acceptable to him. He says of himself, I am the true vine, and my father is the husbandman. Every branch in me that heareth, that beareth not fruit, he taketh away. And every branch that beareth fruit, he purges it, that it may bring forth more fruit. Now ye are clean through the word which I have spoken unto you. Abide in me and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself, except it abide in the vine, no more can ye, except ye abide in me. I am the vine, ye are the branches. He that abideth in me, and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me ye can do nothing. If a man abide not in me, he's cast forth as a branch and is withered. And men gather them and cast them into the fire, and they are burned. If ye abide in me, and my words abide in you, ye shall ask what ye will, and it shall be done unto you. Herein is my Father glorified, that ye bear much fruit, so shall ye be my disciples. There was a time when people would read such verses as this, even members of the church, and say, you see, when you were baptized into Christ as a penitent believer, you underwent uh, lordship baptism. <clears throat> now, what they meant by that was, when you were baptized sometime before that maybe, you were baptized for the remission of your sins, but you didn't have in mind what you ought to have, and that is that Jesus is Lord of your life. Well, I will very readily re uh, recognize that such is a possibility, and some people aren't fully understanding what they're doing when they are obedient to the gospel, that the rest of their life is to be lived under the authority of Christ as it's taught in the Scriptures. But they also said the fruit that you bear will be people that you convert to Christ. Well, I will admit, too, that people that you are instrumental in in converting to Christ certainly would be fruit you would be bearing, but it's not the singular fruit that's talked about here. There's far more, and you may not realize this, to being a faithful child of God, a Christian, a citizen of the kingdom of heaven, than converting people. Now, we probably don't emphasize enough the importance of the Great Commission. Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned. Mark 16, 15, 16. But that's only part of it. In the original Greek language, it is actually saying, as ye go. In other words, wherever you go as a faithful child of God, you're looking for opportunities to teach the gospel to people. It may be that you're sent particularly to some land and you go there strictly to preach the gospel to them. It may be that you're on a business trip 
and you're living in a place for several years, and while you're there, you teach the truth to them. But it's as you go. That's the commission, which means whenever you're going and wherever you're going, and however it is that you are going, you are mindful of preaching the gospel to people. Well, that would be bearing fruit when they heard the gospel. It would be bearing fruit when you went to preach the gospel, whether anybody obeyed it or not. But we need to understand that the fruit that is born out in the faithful church member's life, the Christian's life, is more than even converting people to Christ. It's how you live before the world. It's your own personal commitment to the Lord and devotion to the Lord in prayer and Bible study and in the benevolent activities of the Lord's faithful of caring for those who cannot take care of themselves. After all, it was James who said to Christians in James 1.27, Pure religion and undefiled before God and the Father is this, to visit the widows and orphans in their afflictions and to keep oneself unspotted from the world. Folks, that's bringing forth spiritual fruit. And notice he, call, he called it pure and undefiled religion, your devotions. So I want us to realize that there is far more to bringing forth fruit than reaching people with the gospel and being instrumental in their conversion to Christ. Am I removing the importance of that? Oh, no, I don't think so. Because I think the more dedicated you are to the Lord, the more interested in lost souls you'll be. Now, remember that he said this to his apostles. Let's talk for a moment. <clears throat> the idea here of apostles is that they had a work to do nobody else could do. The word apostolos, or plural, apostoloi, carries with it the idea of people chosen and sent out to accomplish a certain thing. It was a general term used in the Koine Common Greek of the first century, because you could be sent out to do a particular task about anything. But when it came to the apostles of Jesus Christ, he chose them for a certain reason, to be witnesses unto him. And they would be, as I've said many times from this pulpit and elsewhere, the ambassadors of the court of heaven, his throne, his will, to earth. Thus the early church understood in Acts 2.42 that if they were to abide in the Lord's will, they would have to do what the apostles said. So they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine, in the fellowship, breaking of bread and in prayers. They knew that Jesus was revealing his last will and testament originally through the apostles of Jesus Christ. Thus, they continued steadfastly under those apostles, the ambassadors, those who spoke and had authority from Christ to speak and credentials that they were speaking by the Holy Spirit and the miracle signs and wonders that confirmed their speech. They were speaking the will of Jesus. Now, disciples, more general term, it means one who is being disciplined, one who is allowing some code or something that is designed to regulate their lives a certain way to do that. So a person <clears throat> can be a disciple of this, that, or the other. You might be a disciple of Albert Einstein. I don't know. But that carries with it the idea that that which was peculiar to him is also that which you're interested in. So when I say I am a disciple of Jesus Christ, I'm certainly not claiming to be an apostle of Christ. They're dead and gone. But they're teaching the same thing in writing that they taught when they walked this earth. Paul said in uh, Ephesians that when you read what I wrote, you'll understand my knowledge and the mystery of Christ. If I want to know what Paul would teach if he were walking this earth today, just read what he wrote. Because all Scripture is given by inspiration of God. And it's profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto every good work. 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. So our study today is really the true vine and how it impacts being a disciple or discipleship. The text we read must be seen as it was the night, the Lord speaking, the night before his crucifixion the next day. And he and the apostles have just finished eating the Passover 
together. And out of that Passover, he instituted the Lord's Supper. He then told them that he's going to go back to the Father. And as it was at that time in view of the knowledge they have and where they were, they didn't understand him. They didn't really grasp what was going to happen. So he seeks to comfort them, and that's what you have in the beginning of John chapter 14. <clears throat> Where Jesus says, Let not your heart be troubled. When you believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, <coughs> that where I am, there you may be also. So his whole comment here to the apostles, specifically regarding their work, is to comfort, aid, strengthen them, because of what's about to happen to him, and that he will not walk in the flesh with them any longer. Once he dies, he's buried, he's resurrected, he's with them a while, he goes away in ascending to heaven. So he's telling them, how do you continue with me? And he gives them this instruction. In this passage, these verses, verse 8, or 8 verses, <clears throat> I want us to notice the discipleship's foundation. That's the first thing. I think you'll find this relatively simple. And then the relation of the disciples the third thing is discipleship renewed. <clears throat> and the fourth, the response of discipleship. And five, the results of discipleship. To be a disciple of Jesus, to be guided, directed, and led along, to be molded as Christ would have us molded, we must recognize that the root of discipleship <clears throat> is what he says, I, Christ, am the true vine. You see one vineyard, not five or six or 20 or 300 or 600, one vineyard, and that's all there is. The Lord only has one vineyard. It is a terrible thing when men have set up a viewpoint and a concept of Christianity as if there are many vineyards, and there's not. There's only one vineyard. And when he says, I am the true vine, he connects himself together with a number of things where he said, I am this. He said, I am the bread of life. I am the way, the truth of the life. I am the good shepherd. <clears throat> I am the light of the world. I am Lord and master. I am the resurrection. All of those are designed to focus in on Jesus Christ and nobody else. These statements then tell us who Jesus is. He is the Messiah. He is the anointed one. Nobody else has God sent that will take his place. He alone stands above and beyond all. Now, <clears throat> you're about to study the, begin to study the book of Hebrews. And that's going to be paramount in that book that Christ stands out above and beyond all. The root of discipleship lies in knowing that fact. Matthew chapter 16 and verse 16. We must know Jesus. But how does that mean knowing? I know you, you know me, at least to one extent or another. So it's not a knowledge it has to do with a fleshly knowledge. It has to do with knowing who he is, what he teaches. You remember he said, uh, have I been so long with you that you, know, you, you, you don't know me? When you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Well, the Father never took physical form. What did he mean when you've seen me, you've seen the Father? You've seen the way I think it manifested in my words and my actions and my conduct. So you find in John 8, 31 and 32, if you continue in my words, then are you my disciples indeed. 
and ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. So to know Jesus is to know his teachings, to know his doctrine. So if any man will do his will, he said in John 7, 17, he shall know the teaching. I'm quite persuaded after all these years. A lot of people study their Bible. That's the Bible. That's the Word of God. I'm reading it. But they have no disposition. It says, when I learn the will of Christ, and it goes counter to my will, I will set aside my will to submit to his will at all costs. That's when you begin to understand the Bible. And that's what's being said in John 7, 17. If any man willeth to do his will, he shall know the teaching. Well, what if you don't will to do his will? What if you're studying it for some other reason? You're not going to catch it. God has so designed man and his word and how man understands that word as he wants them to, that the will of man is directly involved in it. I'm telling you, your will is your greatest enemy. You can be persuaded intellectually fully that Jesus Christ of Nazareth is the Son of God, that the New Testament is it'll is his testament that it's the word of God that is going to judge us the last day but if your will is not to do his will you're not going to understand the teaching we need to know that he's the source of the words of eternal life remember when some went away because of the hard saying of Christ in John chapter 6 that he turned to his apostles and said will you also go away Peter said, John 6, 68, 69, Lord, to whom shall we go? You know, when you leave something, you're going somewhere else. So if they left Christ, if they left being disciples of Christ, if they left listening to him, if they ceased to abide by his will and they walked away from him, they had to go somewhere. I often think of the rich young ruler. He acknowledged Christ in the right way. He indicated, at least from his own lips, that he'd been living like the law said all this time. But yet he went away sorrowfully because he would not sell all he had and give to the poor and follow Christ. And the lesson there is not that you give all your money away. If the Lord asked me to, that's what I should do, but he hadn't. What it's saying is, is that wherever, wherever the Lord places a demand in your life, then you readily accede to that demand. He wouldn't do it. Now notice it says he went away sorrowfully because he was very rich. Where did he go? You ever wonder where he went? Somebody ought to preach a sermon. Can't think who that might be. Somebody ought to preach a sermon on where did the rich man go? Where did the young rich man go when he left Christ? Well, I guarantee you one thing. He did not go to the one who had the way of life. He had found him. And that tells us people can go to the right one, can hear the right thing, but not be of the disposition of mind to do what they acknowledge is the truth. So there has to be the will. He that willeth to do his will, he shall know of the teaching. Christ alone has salvation from sins. The early church did his date in Acts chapter 4 and verse 12 to declare neither is there salvation any other, for there is none in her name under heaven given among men, whereby we must be saved. Somebody else says there is salvation in this, that, or the other. Not so. It's the authority of Christ, and that authority is in the words of Christ. In the gospel of Christ, God's power to save, Romans 1, 16, that saves us. As Paul said to the church in Philippi, in Philippians 3, 10 to 11, notice his attitude, and you'll see what we're talking about. He says, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings. Have you ever sought the fellowships of the sufferings of Christ? He's not here and he doesn't suffer anymore. Let me suffer on his cat, uh, for the reason he did and on his cause, or on his behalf. In fellowship of his sufferings, being made conformable to his death. Well, why do you think this way, Paul? If by any means I might attain the resurrection of the dead. That's a disciple. That's one discipline of the will of heaven. That's one who willeth to do his will. So knowing Jesus is the root of discipleship. What about the relationship of the disciple? He says, ye are the branches. I've seen people go to this passage and try to say the branches are all the different denominations. But he tells us plainly here that if a man 
abide not in me. He's not talking about churches when he talks about the branches. He's talking about individuals and they're abiding in doing his will or they cease to abide doing his will. Of course, we all recognize that as disciples, we must grow. In 2 Peter chapter 3, 18, Peter said to Christians, but grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ, Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, to whom be glory both now and forever. Amen. There's no room to just say, well, I know all I need to know. I don't care whether you've been a member of the church 50 years or what. There's always a desire to know more. There's always a desire to stir up your mind. There's always a desire to be closer. Now, if you want to see a person who's fallen away from the faith and not a disciple anymore, then just look at the person who never thinks that way. They never think they need to know more. They've got their ticket punched. But I need anything else. The person who has the disposition of a faithful disciple is always driving himself to learn more and to bring every thought and subjection to Jesus Christ. The young in the faith must grow. If you don't, you'll die. When somebody's baptized in the Christ, there ought to be a, 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 a full expose on their part of their desire to know the Bible, their desire to study it, to associate themselves with others who are doing likewise. You'll have to make that choice. Which may mean, or which will mean, no may to it, that you'll have to cease associations with others who have not that interest. Peter wrote, Wherefore, laying aside all malice and all guile and hypocrisies and envies and all evil speaking, as newborn babes, desire the sincere milk of the word that you may grow thereby. 1 Peter 2, 1 and 2. And again, the Christian who, as I said earlier, is a mature Christian, not just a baby in Christ. In Hebrews 5, 12 through 14, For when for the time you ought to be teachers, you have need that one teach you again, which be the first principles of the oracles of God. And there become such as have need of milk, and not strong meat. For everyone that useth milk is unskillful in the word of righteousness. For he's a babe. But strong meat belongeth to them that are of full age, even those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. Do you ever study with the idea that I want to be able, when something comes up, without having to ask anybody else to give the answer the Bible gives? I'm glad there are people, and have been in my life, folks that knew more than I did, that I could appeal to, because of their experience, their involvement, and their study of students of the Bible, good students of the Bible, they help me make a lot of shortcuts. But why shouldn't we be shooting toward the goal so that we can answer these questions with having to lean on somebody else? I'm not opposed to leaning on them. I expect to do some more of it. <laughs> but I'm talking about the standpoint of being that mature in your knowledge of the truth and ability to see through error and uphold the truth. Notice that he emphasizes branches have no life of themselves. While you take any branch and break it off and if left to itself it dies. Truth of the matter is, each one of us, Christians, if we're separated from the Lord, we're dead. We must rely upon the righteousness of Christ. We must rely upon the truth of Christ. Remember Psalm 119, verse 172? Thy tongue shall speak thy word, David said, for all thy commandments are righteousness. If I would be righteous, how can I not know the commandments of God and submit to them? I will be righteous when I do that which makes me righteous. I will not be righteous when I separate myself from those things that make me righteous. In Romans 10, 1 through 3, Paul said to the church in Rome, Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. For I bear them record that they have a zeal of God, but not according to knowledge. For they, being ignorant of God's righteousness, going about to establish their own righteousness, have not submitted themselves unto the righteousness of God. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believeth. Of course, there were the Jews who even believed in Christ but sought to 
teach the Gentiles and have them circumcised, keep the law. Paul fought them. Read Galatians, read Romans, read Hebrews. But it's obvious that he yearned for his own people to be saved and that he would do all he could to save them. Now to the Philippians, in Philippians 3.9 he wrote him that he would be found in him, that is, in Christ. But he says, not having mine own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, through the New Testament system, through that faith for which we are to contend, Jude 3. He says, the righteousness which is of God by faith. That's not teaching salvation by faith only. It's just saying that faith is standing for the New Testament system, which is the totality of the New Testament teaching, the perfect law of liberty, James 1, verse 25. Then we see the renewal of discipleship. The Father cleanses. The Father prunes. Dead branches are cast out. If you've ever dealt with fruit trees, and that would deal with to the vines such as grape and so on, <clears throat> if they are kept pruned every year, there's not much of a problem. But if you don't prune them as they ought to be, and they go for several years, and I especially think of fruit trees, and you ever sit back in to prune them like they ought to be pruned after they've grown wild and for a long time, you'll think, uh, you think you're killing it. In fact, if you can see some of the pictures or even visit vineyards, notice how they're cut back. You'll think they'll never produce anything. But they know what's necessary to get them to produce the best crop possible. Galatians 5.4 because they were leaving the doctrine of Christ, listening to false teachers. Paul said, Christ has become of no effect unto you. Whosoever you are that are justified by the law, ye are fallen from grace. But I hear people today claiming to be disciples of Christ and urging folks to make no distinction in the Old Testament and in the New Testament. Then I know they don't understand the right division of the word. 2 Timothy 2.15. They make no distinction between the design and purpose of the Old Testament and that of the New Testament. Yet only in the New Testament do we have the authority of Christ and He alone has all authority in heaven and on earth, Matthew 28.18. In Hebrews 6, 4 through 6, for it is impossible for those who were once enlightened and have tasted the heavenly gift and were made partakers of the Holy Ghost and have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the world to come, if they shall fall away, to renew them again into repentance, seeing they crucify to themselves the Son of God afresh and put him to an open shame. I want you to think about the message of this and make sure you really understand the message. The people to whom this letter were written were Jews who knew the truth of the gospel, had believed and obeyed it, and due to persecution were actually thinking about walking away from the intestinal system. <clears throat> now that's not talking about people who commit sin or are taken a trespass and need to repent. That's talking about people who give up the whole New Testament system. Now let me ask you this. If you just tear your New Testament out of your Bible and say, I'm not going to follow it any longer. How are you going to know anything at all about how to become a Christian, how to live the Christian life? what the church is, its work organization, worship, and so on. You won't. And if you do that, then you've committed the sin that's involved and talked about in Hebrews 6, 4 through 6. There's nothing else left to change you. There's nothing to come. When this third Christian dispensation, this age is over, all men will be brought into judgment. There will not be a fourth age where God says, well, we'll continue on giving people the opportunity to be saved. And so that's what the writer of Hebrews is saying here. If you give this up, there's nothing else to look forward to as far as salvation is concerned. That salvation is in Christ and in His Word, the seed of the kingdom, the Word of God, Luke 8, 11. And you're cutting yourself loose from the vine if you do that. 
live branches, as I said earlier, are pruned so that they will produce more fruit. Look at what he said <clears throat> in Hebrews 12, verses 5 through 11. And ye have forgotten the exhortation which speaketh unto you as unto children. My son, despise not thou the chastening of the Lord, nor faint when thou art rebuked of him. For whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth, and scourgeth every son that he receiveth. If ye endure chastening, God dealing with you as with sons. For what son is he whom the Father chasteneth not? But if ye be without chastisement, whereof all are partakers, then are ye bastards and not sons. I don't know how language can be clearer, but listen, he goes on. Furthermore, we have had fathers of our flesh which corrected us, and we gave them reverence. Shall we not much rather be in subjection unto the Father of spirits and live? For they verily for a few days chastened us after their own pleasure. But he for our profit, that we might be partakers of his holiness. Now no chastening for the present seemeth to be joyous, but grievous. Nevertheless, afterward he yieldeth the peaceable fruit of righteousness unto them which are exercised thereby. Wherefore, lift up the hands which hang down and the feeble knees. What is that telling me? If you're faithful to the Lord, he's going to take you to the woodshed sometime. And you wouldn't mean anything to him if you didn't. That's the way it works. If not, that passage it makes no sense whatsoever. Live branches are pruned to produce more fruit. And that's what we're seeing. What is the response of discipleship? It's to abide the vine. Keep on keeping on. Remain means um, continuing as First Corinthians fifteen fifty eight says. Be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. For as much as you know your labor is not in vain in the Lord. And what will the result of that be? That's how you'll bear fruit. Now, we started with that in the beginning. And yes, it'll involve looking for opportunity to teach others and to bring them to Christ. But it'll involve your activities in the church. Of all those things that enjoined upon Christians to do about being concerned about others. And we must abide in his words in order that to happen. We're taught, let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. He says that you might walk worthy of the Lord unto all pleasing, being fruitful in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. Colossians 1.10, the other was Matthew 5.16. And in Galatians 5.22 and 23, But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance, that's self-control. Against such there is no law. That's being a disciple. So the true vine provides everything we need for true discipleship. It's the root of discipleship, the relationship of the disciple one to another, the renewal of discipleship, the response of discipleship, and the end result of discipleship. Something to be a disciple, and we don't want to cease being a disciple. A learner, one disciplined by the Lord, one that is following the truth, one that will not turn loose of the truth, one that will forever study the truth and abide by it. If you're not a child of God this morning, the Lord says you must believe that He's the Son of God. Repent of your sins, confess your faith in Him, and be buried with the Lord in baptism to obtain the remission or forgiveness of sins. More than that, He doesn't enjoin upon you. Less than that, you cannot do and be saved from your sins. As a child of God, if you've wandered, we urge you to repent. In God's second law of pardon, confess those sins and pray God for forgiveness. If you have any need of a spiritual nature, as we've described, we invite you to come then while we stand and sing.